Shalom, everyone. This is uh, another unplugged, live and unplugged, I should say, heartbeat of the Torah. And um, we're going to be studying the parsha tonight. And I'm just going to wait a few minutes to allow people to come on. I hope you're having a good day. And um, um, let's see, well, as soon as I see somebody on, let me know if you can um, hear me okay. Just want to make sure that everything's working. I forgot to check that in the past, and it's a darn good thing that it was working okay. If you can hear me, just let me know everything is okay, that you can hear all right. I'm looking forward to being with you tonight and sharing um, this wonderful Torah portion, another one about Avraham, our father Avraham. And um, we're going to get started in a few minutes. I'm just waiting to uh, make sure that um, um, some people that I know wanted to be on are on. So if you're here, send me a little text. Let me know you're, let me make a comment. Let me know you're here. <clears throat> My mom is on. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> My faithful family. My biggest fans. <laughs> So anyway, it's uh, already nightfall tonight. Um, my daddy's there. Hi, daddy. It's good to see you. I'm hoping some of our other friends are going to get on. Um, it's a, uh, hi, mom. It's a lovely night. We've got a fall night. Hi, Dan. Um, it's good to, good to see that you're all here. And hopefully a few more people will join. I know it's kind of a bad time because people are working, so... <clears throat> At any rate, um, I'll just wait a couple more, a few more secs, and then we'll get started. So I hope you're all having a good morning um, so far, and I'm uh, enjoying the fall weather. We've definitely turned cooler, and uh, I think we're in the mid-70s now during the daytime, so that's really nice. And no humidity. Yay! Yay! Well, I think I'm just going to get started. So, um, I, as I said earlier, welcome. Hi, Anita. Good to see you here. Um, once again, welcome to a live and unplugged edition of Heartbeat of the Torah. My name is Devora Kalik, and I'm with Bless Israel Network. Please do share this because uh, we have a really fantastic Torah portion on Abraham again and the things that he did that changed his life and destiny and will change ours if we do the same. Well, so this week we're on our fourth parasha, our fourth Torah portion in Bereshit or Genesis. And it's called Vayera, which means, and he appeared. And the verses for this uh, Torah portion are Genesis 18.1, to 22:24. Well, like all Torah portions, this one is jam-packed with so much and we just are going to be mainly focusing, believe it or not, on two verses in the beginning, Genesis 18:1 and 2 because there's just so much as usual there. Well, Avraham, the father of the Jewish people, is what we call a tzaddik a righteous man. If you notice, there are actually three Torah portions dedicated to him. They are called Lech Lecha, which is last week, and Bayera, which is this week, and Chaye Sarah, which is next week about Sarah. But in reality, the rest of the book of Genesis is still about him. And that's because it's all about the rest of the book of Bereshit of Genesis is all about his um, descendants who, of course, followed in his footsteps. Abraham's legacy continues to affect all of us and Israel today. I've learned that to know Avraham is to have a firm grasp on our identity. To know Avraham is to have a clear vision of our purpose in this life. And to know Avraham is to more intimately know and understand the Messiah of Israel. 
Avraham is the first human being to com complete the mission that God gave him. Does that shock you? Well, if it does, you just need to study him a little bit more so you can see this truth for yourself. Well, let's begin with our Torah portion. It begins like this. I'll read it first in Hebrew and then I'll read it in English. Vayera elive Hashem be'elone mamre vehu yoshev patach ha'ohel kechom hayom. The Lord appeared to him by the plains of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day. This is Genesis 18.1. Well, Or HaChayim was a rabbi who was born in Morocco in 1696. He lived most of his life in Italy and his latter life in Israel. He is very famous, though he only lived until he was 47 years old. He is famous for his commentary on the five books of the Torah and is also known for his cutting edge explanations and insights into the mysteries or what we call the Sod, secret in Hebrew. Or HaChaim points out the unusual structure of this first sentence in our Torah portion in Hebrew. The word Eliv, which means to him, speaking of Abraham, is placed oddly between Vayera and Hashem, meaning the Lord. The structure actually is translated kind of strange, and it would be literally, he appeared to him, Hashem, or the Lord. Or HaChaim writes, we need to understand why the Torah changed from its usual style and stated the word alive, which refers to the one to whom he appeared, um, or the one to whom the appearance was made, which is Abraham, before stating the word Hashem, who really is referring to the one who appeared. What Or HaChaim goes into to explain is that normally the text would say in Hebrew, Vayera Hashem alive, meaning Hashem appeared to him, Abraham. Normally, the text should identify who made the appearance before it goes on to say who he appeared to. And indeed, we find that this is how the Torah speaks in all other places where it refers to the Lord appearing to Avraham. In Genesis 12, 7, for example, it says the way it should. Vayera Hashem el Avraham. Hashem appeared to Avraham and said to him, to your offspring, I will give this land. And then in Genesis 17, 1, the structure is the same. Vayera Hashem el Avraham. And, um, and it says, Hashem appeared to Avraham and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. Now, in both of these cases, the verse puts the two words, Vayera and Hashem together. And uh, Al Avraham or El Avraham is not in between them. Or HaChayim is really bothered by this and wants to understand why this verse is arranged so differently here. Well, before we solve this first question, we need to look at another issue, the word Vayera. This word is from the verb meaning to see, Lirot. Often when this word is used in the Torah, it doesn't mean only to physically see something with our eyes, but to see in a prophetic sense, like meaning to perceive something. And when Hashem appears to someone, it is usually and most always to deliver a prophecy. However, in this case, in our parasha in Genesis 18.1, Hashem appeared to Avraham, but the Torah doesn't tell us that he said anything at all to him. 
Or Hachaim continues. Rather, it immediately proceeds to relate the incident of the three Malachim, the three angels. So then what was the purpose of Hashem appearing to Avraham here, he asks. Well, our sages stated, along with Rashi, who is the great sage of the Middle Ages, a French rabbi who was known for um, this Peshat, what's called the simple, literal, contextual meaning of the text. Well, Rashi and the sages agreed, and it says this, Hashem had come to visit Avraham, who was ill from the pain of his Brit, brit Milah, his Brit Milah, his circumcision. If you remember, last week's Torah portion ended with, Hash with um, Avraham circumcising himself in his household. Ouch. Accordingly, Hashem, in fact, did not come to give a prophetic message to Avraham, but simply, they say, to visit him as one would visit the sick. I love this. Though there is indeed much truth to this, this really doesn't answer our question. The order of the Hebrew is hinting at something else. So now, in good Jewish fashion, we have two unanswered questions. Number one, why does the Torah place alive to him, speaking of Avraham, between Vayera and Hashem, when normally it would say Vayera Hashem alive, as it does in Genesis 12, 7 and 17, 1. Second question is why did Hashem appear to Avraham when no nevua, no prophecy, was given to him, as it was in the examples we just talked about in Genesis 12, 7 and 17, 1? All right, so we're getting, we're getting to the meat of this, and it's very interesting. Or HaChayim suggests, <coughs> excuse me, Or HaChayim suggests an approach which actually answers both questions. This is what he writes. It seems correct to say that the Torah's intention in phrasing the verse this way is that it comes to inform us that by appearing to Avraham at this time, Hashem was resting his Shekhinah, his Shekinah, his dwelling presence upon Avraham so that he became a chariot of the Shekhinah or of the Shekinah. For you find that our sages of blessed memory stated, and this was in the great, in the in Midrash Rabbah, the great Midrash in Genesis Rabbah 82.6, the patriarchs are the chariot of the Shekhinah, of the dwelling presence of God. Well, what does this mean? Well, according to the Jewish sages of blessed memory, the patriarchs, negated their own personal urges and desires and interests so much because they chose to serve Hashem wholeheartedly. This is called in Hebrew, bitul, self-abnegation or denial, self-denial. They subjugated themselves completely to the will of Hashem. And by doing this, they made themselves worthy of being a seat or dwelling place for the Shekhinah in this world. According to another rabbi, Gur or, or Ariyeh, on Genesis Rabbah in chapter 17, uh, section 22, it says this, This is much like a king who would sit in a chariot and travel around doing this or that. Wherever the patriarchs went, the Shekhinah, the dwelling presence of Hashem, went with them. Or HaChaim continues, and he says, this is what is meant here when it says, Vayera Elive, Hashem. It means that Hashem revealed his dwelling presence to him, to Avraham, 
resting it upon him continuously to indicate that this was not a momentary appearance, but which became part of Avraham's essence. For the Shekhinah was now revealed upon Avraham on a permanent basis. To support this, Or HaChayim cites the fact that the word Vayira, meaning and Hashem appeared, is no longer stated in any of the future prophecies that were conveyed to Avraham after this point. Rather, in all future prophecies, it simply says, and Hashem said to Avraham. And you can see Genesis 18, 20 for that and Genesis 21, 12 as examples. For since Avraham was a chariot for the dwelling presence, Hashem was always present before him with his Shekinah resting upon him like a crown upon his head. Therefore, there was no need for Hashem to appear to Avraham only to speak to him. What a lesson and a model, a beautiful model this is for us. I want to ask you a serious question. Who do you think is a chariot for the Shekinah, the Shekinah today? Well, this is our job, my brothers and sisters, my friends, my family. I'm not saying we're at the level of our patriarchs. We do not have the same level of revelation they had, but we who follow in the footsteps of Avraham and we who are undergoing that internal transformation that I spoke of last week via a circumcision of the heart, we who are taking on the DNA of Hashem we who are developing a Jewish neshama, we who have Ahavat Yisrael, the love of Israel in our hearts, we are the chariot of Hashem. He dwells with us and our job is to carry him around wherever he wants to go, wherever he wants to reveal himself in our families, in our workplaces, in our synagogues, to our friends, to our, our families, to the stranger, to anyone who does not yet know the God of Israel and anyone who doesn't believe in the Messiah and the Torah. Well, let's look at Genesis 18.1 one, one more time. It says, Vayera Elav Hashem Be'elonai Namre vehu yoshev pata haohel kechom hayom. The Lord appeared to him by the plains of Mamre, or Mamre. He was sitting at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day. Well, what kind of heat is this, and why is it even mentioned? These are good questions, and we should always, when we're reading the Bible, reading the Torah, we should always look at the task, text and ask questions, because I'm telling you, everything has meaning. So it says there, kechom hayom, in the heat of the day. Well, it's translated in the heat of the day, but guess what? If it was the in the heat of the day, it would say Bahom Hayom. Bahom Hayom. That's different than Kehom Hayom. It says like the heat of the day. The letter Kaf before the heat, the word for heat, is like or as. So it really means like the heat of the day or as in the heat of the day. Of course, in the simple, literal meaning, the Peshat, it was the hottest day of the year. Interestingly, Rashi quoting the Midrash Rabbah again has an answer for this. Rashi says, and he's quoting another rabbi, Rabbi Ben Hanina in the Babylonian Talmud, 
in Tractate Bhava Metsiya, page 86b. He says, Rashi says, that Hashem took the sun out of its sheath so that the righteous man would not be troubled by wayfarers, by travelers. And this gets explained further in the Midrash Rabbah, and exp they explain that this was not an ordinary heat. Rabbi Yanai said, while Avraham was recovering from his circumcision, God punctured a hole in the wall that separates the world from Gehenna or hell. And within a brief moment, heated up the entire world together with its inhabitants. Now I wanna explain that this is a Gothic literature and it may not be exactly what happened, but the rabbis would do this and talk about something to tell a story first so we'd remember it and second to make a point. So um, so basically they, they said that he punched this hole and then God said, for the Holy One, blessed be he said, shall the righteous be in pain while the rest of the world is content and comfortable? This is, they say teaches us that the heat is beneficial for healing a wound. By saying this, Rabbi Yanai means that God brought the heat to the world in order to expedite the healing process for Avraham and his household. Well, let's look at Malachi 3.19 to get a little more clarity on this and to get a slightly different perspective. Malachi 3.19 says, for behold, the day comes. Well, let's stop for a minute. What day? What day comes? Well, this is referring to the day of the Lord, the great and terrible day of the Lord when the wicked are, are judged. Th that day comes and it shall burn like an oven and all the arrogant and all who do wickedly shall be stubble and the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will not leave them root or branch. And then we have verse 20. I know that's kind of unpleasant, but anyway, we'll move on. And then we have verse 20, which our sages say explains why the sun was hot that day and it was the third day and most painful day of Avraham's circumcision. And they write, but to you, or they remind us of verse 20 in Malachi, but to you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall arise with healing in its wings. Now this verse is telling us that on the day of the Lord, on the great and terrible day of the Lord, the sun will burn the wicked, but it will heal the righteous. Now hold on to that for a minute. Hold on to Malachi 3, 19 and 20 for just a minute. We're gonna come back to it. So let's look at um, Bereshit, Genesis 18, 2. And it says, he lifted his eyes and saw, and behold, three men were standing over him. He perceived so he ran toward them. As soon as Avraham stood up, he ran to the strangers. By the way, the sages don't agree on whether or not he knew that they were angels in case you were thinking that that was his motivation. I personally do not think he knew at that point. He was praying for wayfarers, for travelers, in his weakened and painful condition, rather than thinking about himself. He just wanted to share his faith and teach them about his God. He was thinking of their souls, not himself. And that same sun that was burning like a furnace healed his circumcision wounds because he got up and ran. Of course, this is a miracle. Well, this teaches us something, that when we are focused on the things which concern our Heavenly Father, 
He will occupy himself with the things which concern us. I've seen this over and over in my own life. Avraham sanctified himself. He made himself holy. Every time you and I obey a mitzvah, a commandment, we actually increase our spiritual stature, meaning we become holy as Hashem is holy and as Messiah is holy. Well, let's learn something amazing from the gematria. That's the numerical value of words and phrases, and we find word relationships with the same value. Well, the words Shemesh, Tzadikah, the son of righteousness, have something deeper to teach us. What is this son of righteousness? Now, by the way, it's the real son. It's Shemesh, the literal son, not S-O-N, which would be Ben. Okay, the words son of righteousness, Shemesh Tzadakah, have a value of 839. And it's the same value as the word Lehit Kadesh, to become holy, as it says in Leviticus 20, verse 7, where it says there, Eat Kadashtem, Eat Kadishtem, rather, sanctify yourselves, separate yourselves, and be holy, for I am holy. Whenever a verb in Hebrew has the prefix um, he tav, it's pronounced heat, it is a reflexive and intensive verb, meaning that it's something that you do or I do intensively and deliberately to yourself or to myself. It also means this something that you do to yourself is a process. It's not something that happens instantaneously. It's interesting because in Leviticus 27, it says, Eat kadishtem vayitem kedoshim. Make yourselves holy and be holy, for I am holy. This is God speaking. We must make a deliberate and intensive effort to separate ourselves from this world. That's the make yourselves holy part. This essentially means doing mitzvot, the commandments. That's how we become holy. Giving charity to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick, eating kosher, guarding the Shabbat, studying Torah together. These are all ways that we can separate ourselves and make ourselves holy. They are all deliberate actions that we take upon ourselves. The be holy part is about how Hashem sees us when we make that effort. As we live out the commandments in his eyes, we are already holy. That's how he sees us. This is really great news. And I'll tell you another piece of great news. I've shared this quite a lot in the past in my teachings, but for those who may not know this, there's another rabbi called the Ramad, the Ramad Vali, and he was a student of a great Italian rabbi named the Ramchal and actually surpassed his rabbi and became his teacher. Well, he said this, quoting the Talmud, when one strives for Kedusha, holiness, Hashem will assist him. How will he assist him? Well, he says, because the one who purifies himself is sent divine assistance from heaven. That's in the Talmud in Tractate Yoma on page 39a. I don't know about you, but when I first heard this, I went, wow, we get sent divine assistance from heaven? Well, what does this mean? The moment we turn our hearts toward doing a mitzvah, a commandment, a good deed, the moment we turn our feet to doing that mitzvah, as soon as the action begins, God sends us assistance. 
from heaven. Why? To help us complete it, of course. He wants us to be successful. I love this. This holiness, doing the mitzvot, is what will protect us from the burning sun in the day of the Lord and will also heal us from any afflictions that we have. Well, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And remember a couple weeks ago, we defined the seven principles of a tzaddik. I'm not going to go over them again. Um, you can either refer to that video or you can write to me and ask me for my notes. I'll be happy to share them with you. So the seven principles of a tzaddik we talked about, and we talked about Noah and the principle of the chibur, the connector, the connector between heaven and earth. A chibur is someone who has a connection with God and he or she shows others how to have a chibur, a connection with God as well. Excuse me. This is another one of those seven principles who make a tzaddik, what I'm going to talk to you about next. And it's something very practical that most of us can do. And it's something that I learned um, in my home growing up from my parents. Avraham, <coughs> excuse me. Avraham was the creme de la creme, as we say in French, in French at welcoming guests. <coughs> I'm talking about what's called hachnasat ochim, which translates into English as hospitality. But hachnasat ochim is a lot more than that. It is faith in action. And our sages call this the eshel principle. A shell is um, the word for tamarisk, is a word for a grove that Avraham planted of tamarisk trees. And it, it's spelled uh, Aleph Shin Lamed, and it serves as an acronym to remind us what Hachnasat Orchim is, what Jewish hospitality is. A tzaddik is one who lives in active faith. I said that and who always seeks to capture every opportunity. He or she is looking for others who are in physical and or spiritual need, and he stays the course with them to be sure they will go the distance on the right path. The origin of the word eshel, as I just mentioned, comes from Genesis 21, 33, where Avraham planted that grove of trees in Beersheba, which is where he lived. Well, what does Eshel stand for? The Jewish sages of blessed memory said it is an acronym for the word Achila, which means eating or feeding, Shteya, which means drinking, and Livui, which means escorting. The acronym is a reminder of the principle of Hachnasar Ochim, demonstrated by Avraham in Genesis 18. He ran to those men, men, to meet their physical needs, Achila, and their spiritual needs. His intention was to tell them about the Torah and about the God of Israel. And then after they ate and drank, Avraham escorted them. He went the extra distance to make sure they got on the right path, the right way. Well, the Jewish sages of blessed memory provide us with a halachic understanding, a, um, a Jewish law understanding of Hachnasar Ochim in several places. In the Talmud, again, in Tractate Shabbat on page 127a, it is said that the wayfarer, the traveler, the stranger, brings the Shekhinah with him or her. In the Avot de Rebbe Natan, another uh, piece of literature and a companion to Pirkei Avot, which is the sayings 
um, of the fathers it has a lot of ethical things in there. It gives, it says this, if a man, I love this, if a man gives his friend the best gifts in the world and his face is sour, it is if he gave him nothing. The one who greets his friend or strangers with hospitality, even if nothing was given to him, it is as if he gave him all the gifts of heaven. Right here, we're talking about our attitude, our what we call kavana, our motivation for doing the things that we do. Well, in addition, there are many examples of halachic understanding according to Jewish law left for us in the Brit HaDashah, in the New Testament, by the disciples of Yeshua. You can find them in the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and then in the letter to, uh, written by Peter, um, or Petros, or Shimon Kepha, in 1 Peter 4, 9, and also in the Gospel, the Besola of Luke, chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, just to name a few. There are many more, but just to name a few. Wherever you see the word hospitality, and you're reading anything Jewish, it is speaking of what I just shared with you. Hachnasat Ochim. Well, as we talked about a few moments ago, Avraham was more concerned with these travelers and their physical and their spiritual needs than he was with his own pain. He wasn't thinking of himself. Instead, he was sitting at the doorway of his tent in a heat wave, hoping, praying, looking for some strangers that he could serve refreshment and tell about his God. He wanted to rescue them from the fires of Gehenna, which is hell. Well, this is what is meant in our verse, Patach HaOhel. Avraham was sitting by the opening or door of his tent Listen to the Midrash once again. God said to Avraham, You have opened a good door to passers-by. You have opened a door for converts. For if it were not for you, I would not have created heaven and earth. As it is written regarding the heavens, and he stretches them like a tent, O hell, to dwell in. That's in Isaiah 40, verse 22. Well, what do we learn from all this, my friends? Avraham opened his door for people to come to belief in the God of Israel, in Hashem, the Lord. Because he did this, the Chazal, the Jewish sages say, he merited a greater revelation of Hashem at this time. In the third day, of his brit milah, his circumcision, which is the worst day. Well, we have in this parasha a recipe of sorts, a list of ingredients for making of a servant, for the making of a servant of the Most High, a tzaddik, one who emulates our patriarchs and our Messiah. This is a summary list of today's points, but of course, it's not all inclusive. Number one, to use the words of our blessed sages, we are to be a chariot for the Shekhinah, the dwelling presence of God. Let others see the king through you. Love people as he would. Two, we must pursue a circumcision of our hearts every day. It talks about this in Deuteronomy 10, 16, about circumcising our hearts in Jeremiah 4, 4. And then in Jeremiah 9, 24 and 25, it tells us that physical circumcision is not enough. Practicing bitul or self-denial means we have our door open to be visited by the Shekhinah who comes with those who we invite to our home. And we can expect to receive prophecy and see the supernatural 
in our lives. And I can tell you, I have seen both. Three, is pain and suffering is part of the circumcision process. Isaiah 63, 9 tells us, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. Who is the there and who is the he? Well, the there is Israel, the Jewish people, and the he is Messiah. Messiah chose to be afflicted as the Jewish people have been afflicted. Isaiah 63 tells us this. Why? Because he bore Israel's burdens, sin, and sufferings. And if we are joined to Israel, this means we too will have circumcision wounds and bandages. We will share in the sufferings of Messiah and Israel. As a skilled surgeon, God will cut away those things which prevent us from fulfilling our mission in this world. C cutting hurts. Surgery hurts. The klipa, which represents our evil inclination, has to be broken so that we can receive the nourishment which causes us to grow and become a reflection of our God in this world. At times, he will turn up the heat. That heat is designed to heal us, not to kill us. Well, number four, what does a true circumcision of the heart look like? I talked a lot about it last week. What are the actions of such a righteous person? It means we should do the things Avraham did. It means we should do the things our Messiah did. It means we daily lay our lives on an altar. And when it begins to burn, we submit to it. This is the only way to kill the Yetzer Hara, our evil inclination, so that our soul can thrive, so that our neshama can thrive. There's one more thing that we need to talk about briefly. We must obey the commandments with a certain demeanor. Like Avraham, we should be running and hurrying, showing a deliberate intention to serve our king. And the primary way we serve our king is to serve other people. This is called kavana, heart intention. In this parsha, in this Torah portion, we see that Avraham never delayed in his obedience to do a commandment. And it was true for every test that he faced. In what Rashi and Rambam define as his 10th and final test, Avraham got up early in the morning to journey to Mount Moriah, to Mount Moriah, to sacrifice his precious son. He didn't delay. He got up early and ran. Well, he went up the mountain. When we occupy ourselves with Torah and mitzvot, meaning when we're building the kingdom of God on earth, we can be assured that Hashem will occupy himself with all the things that concern us, just as he did with Avraham. As we meet others' needs, he will meet ours. Well, that's it for today, my precious family and friends. Bezrat Hashem, with God's help, I will see you next week at the same time for Parashat Chaye Sarah, where we begin talking about Sarah's death and a lot of other very interesting things that um, happen. I hope you have a great day today being the chariot of the Shekhinah. Shabbat Shalom from Israel. Litroot.